Dedication of The Culprit Fay and Other Poems This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Peter Oxenhandler The Culprit Fay and Other Poems by Joseph Rodman Drake Dedication Published in the year 1836 To Her Father's Friend Fitzgreen Halleck. These poems are respectfully inscribed by the author's daughter. End of dedication. This recording is in the public domain. Chapter 1 of The Culprit Fay and Other Poems. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Diana Schmidt. The Culprit Fay and Other Poems by Joseph Rodman Drake. The Culprit Fay. My visual orbs are purged from film, and lo, instead of Anster's turnip bearing veils, I see old Fairyland's miraculous show. Her trees of tinsel, kissed by freakish gales, her oafs, that cloaked in leaf gold, skim the breeze, and fairies swarming, tenants answer fair. 1. Tis the middle watch of a summer's night. The earth is dark, but the heavens are bright. Naught is seen in the vault on high, but the moon and the stars and the cloudless sky, and the flood which rolls its milky hue, a river of light on the welkin blue. The moon looks down on old crow-nest, she mellows the shades on his shaggy breast, and seems his huge gray form to throw in a sliver cone on the wave below. His sides are broken by spots of shade, by the walnut bough and the cedar maid, and through their clustering branches dark glimmers and dies the firefly's spark, like starry twinkles that momently break through the rifts of the gathering tempest's wreck. 2. The stars are on the moving stream, and fling, as its ripples gently flow, a burnished length of wavy beam in an eel-like spiral line below. The winds are whist, and the owl is still. The bat in the shelvy rock is hid, and naught is heard on the lonely hill, but the crickets chirp, and the answer shrill, of the gauzed winged katie did and the plaint of the wailing whippoorwill who moans unseen and ceaseless sings ever a note of wail and woe till morning spreads her rosy wings and earth and sky in her glances glow three tis the hour of fairy ban and spell the wood tick has kept the minutes well he has counted them all with click and stroke deep in the heart of the mountain oak. And he has awakened the sentry elf, who sleeps with him in the haunted tree, to bid him ring the hour of twelve, and call the fays to their revelry. Twelve small strokes on his tinkling bell, t'was made of the white snail's pearly shell. Midnight comes and all is well. Hither, hither, wing your way, tis the dawn of the fairy day. 4. They come from beds of lichen green. They creep from the mullen's velvet screen. Some on the backs of beetles fly from the silver tops of moon-touched trees where they swung in their cobweb hammocks high and rocked about in the evening breeze. Some from the humbird's downy nest. They had driven him out by elfin power and pillowed on plumes of his rainbow breast had slumbered there till the charmed hour. Some had lain in the scoop of the rock, with glittering icing stars inlaid, and some had opened the four o'clock, and stole within its purple shade, and now they throng the moonlight glade, above, below, on every side, their little minim forms arrayed in the tricksy pomp of fairy pride. 5. They come not now to print the lee, in freak and dance around the tree, or at the mushroom board to sup and drink the dew from the buttercup, 
a scene of sorrow waits them now for an oaf has broken his vestal vow he has loved an earthly maid and left for her his woodland shade he has lain upon her lip of dew and sunned him in her eye of blue fanned her cheek with his wing of air played in the ringlets of her hair and nestling on her snowy breast forgot the lily king's behest for this the shadowy tribes of air to the elfin court must haste away and now they stand expectant there to hear the doom of the culprit fay six the throne was reared upon the grass of spicewood and of sassafras on pillars of mottled tortoise shell hung the burnished canopy and o'er it gorgeous curtains fell of the tulip's crimson drapery the monarch sat on his judgment seat on his brow the crown imperial shone the prisoner fay was at his feet and his peers were ranged around the throne he waved his sceptre in the air he looked around and calmly spoke his brow was grave and his eye severe but his voice in a softened accent broke seven fairy fairy list and mark thou hast broke thine elfin chain thy flamewood lamp is quenched and dark and thy wings are dyed with a deadly stain thou hast sullied thine elfin purity in the glance of a mortal maiden's eye thou hast scorned our dread decree and thou shouldst pay the forfeit high but well i know her sinless mind is pure as the angel forms above gentle and meek and chaste and kind such as a spirit well might love fairy had she spot or taint bitter had been thy punishment tied to the hornet's shardy wings tossed on the pricks of nettles stings or seven long ages doomed to dwell with the lazy worm in the walnut shell or every night to writhe and bleed beneath the tread of the centipede or bound in a cobweb dungeon dim your jailer a spider huge and grim amid the carrion bodies to lie of the worm and the bug and the murdered fly these it had been your lot to bear had a stain been found on the earthly fair now list and mark our mild decree fairy this your doom must be eight thou shalt seek the beach of sand where the water bounds the elfin land thou shalt watch the oozy brine till the sturgeon leaps in the bright moonshine then dart the glistening arc below and catch a drop from his silver bow the water sprites will wield their arms and dash around with roar and rave and vain are the woodland spirits charms they are the imps that rule the wave yet trust thee in thy single might if thy heart be pure and thy spirit right thou shalt win the warlock fight nine if the spray bead gem be won the stain of thy wing is washed away but another errand must be done ere thy crime be lost for i thy flamewood lamp is quenched and dark thou must re-illumine its spark mount thy steed and spur him high to the heaven's blue canopy and when thou seest a shooting star follow it fast and follow it far the last faint spark of its burning train shall light the elfin lamp again thou hast heard our sentence fay hence to the waterside away ten the goblin marked his monarch well he spake not but he bowed him low then plucked a crimson colin bell and turned him round in act to go the way is long he cannot fly his soiled wing has lost its power and he winds adown the mountain high for many a sore and weary hour through dreary beds of tangled fern through groves of nightshade dark and dern over the grass and through the brake where toils the ant and sleeps the snake now o'er the violet's azure flush he skips along in lights a mood and now he thrids the bramble bush till its points are dyed in fairy blood he has leapt the bog he has pierced the briar he has swum the brook and waded the mire 
till his spirits sank and his limbs grew weak and the red waxed fainter in his cheek he had fallen to the ground outright for rugged and dim was his onward track but there came a spotted toad in sight and he laughed as he jumped upon her back he bridled her mouth with a silk weed twist and lashed her sides with an osier thong and now through evening's dewy mist with leap and spring they bound along till the mountain's magic verge is past and the beach of sand is reached at last eleven soft and pale is the moony beam moveless still the glassy stream the wave is clear the beach is bright with snowy shells and sparkling stones the shore surge comes in ripples light in murmurings faint and distant moans and ever afar in the silent steep is heard the splash of the sturgeon's leap and the bend of his graceful bow is seen a glittering arc of silver sheen spanning the wave of burnished blue and dripping with gems of the river dew twelve the elfin cast a glance around as he lighted down from his coarser toad then round his breast his wings he wound and close to the river's brink he strode he sprang on a rock he breathed a prayer above his head his arms he threw then tossed a tiny curve in air and headlong plunged in the water's blue thirteen up sprung the spirits of the waves from the sea silk beds in their coral caves with snail plate armor snatched in haste they speed their way through the liquid waste some are rapidly borne along on the mailed shrimp or the prickly prong some on the blood-red leeches glide some on the stony starfish ride some on the back of the lancing squab some on the sidelong soldier crab and some on the jellied coral that flings at once a thousand streamy stings they cut the wave with the living oar and hurry on to the moonlight shore to guard their realms and chase away the footsteps of the invading fay fourteen fearlessly he skims along his hope is high and his limbs are strong he spreads his arms like the swallow's wing and throws his feet with a frog-like fling his locks of gold on the waters shine at his breast the tiny foam beads rise his back gleams bright above the brine and the wake-line foam behind him lies but the water sprites are gathering near to check his course along the tide their warriors come in swift career and hem him round on every side on his thigh the leech has fixed his hold the quarrel's long arms are round him rolled the prickly prong has pierced his skin and the squab has thrown his javelin the gritty star has rubbed him raw and the crab has struck with his giant claw he howls with rage and he shrieks with pain he strikes around but his blows are vain hopeless is the unequal fight fairy naught is left but flight fifteen he turned him round and fled amain with hurry and dash to the beach again he twisted over from side to side and laid his cheek to the cleaving tide the strokes of his plunging arms are fleet and with all his might he flings his feet but the water spirits are round him still to cross his path and work him ill they bade the wave before him rise they flung the sea-fire in his eyes and they stunned his ears with the scallop stroke with the porpoise heave and the drum-fish croak oh but a weary wight was he when he reached the foot of the dogwood tree gashed and wounded and stiff and sore he laid him down on the sandy shore he blessed the force of the charmed line and he banned the water goblin's spite for he saw around in the sweet moonshine their little wee faces above the brine giggling and laughing with all their might at the piteous hap of the fairy wight sixteen soon he gathered the balsam dew from the sorrel leaf and the henbane bud 
over each wound the balm he drew and with cobweb lint he stanched the blood the mild west wind was soft and low it cooled the heat of his burning brow and he felt new life in his sinew shoot as he drank the juice of the calmus root and now he treads the fatal shore as fresh and vigorous as before seventeen wrapped in musings stands the sprite tis the middle wane of night his task is hard his way is far but he must do his errand right ere dawning mounts her beamy car and rolls her chariot wheels of light and vain are the spells of fairyland he must work with a human hand eighteen he cast a saddened look around but he felt new joy his bosom swell when glittering on the shadowed ground he saw a purple mussel shell thither he ran and he bent him low he heaved at the stern and he heaved at the bow and he pushed her over the yielding sand till he came to the verge of the haunted land she was as lovely a pleasure boat as ever fairy had paddled in for she glowed with purple paint without and shone with silvery pearl within a sculler's notch in the stern he made an oar he shaped of the boodle blade then spung to his seat with a lightsome leap and launched afar on the calm blue deep nineteen the imps of the river yell and rave they had no power above the wave but they heaved the billow before the prow and they dashed the surge against her side and they struck her keel with jerk and blow till the gunwale bent to the rocking tide she wimpled about in the pale moonbeam like a feather that floats on a wind-tossed stream and momently athwart her track the quarrel upreared his island back and the fluttering scallop behind would float and patter the water about the boat but he bailed her out with his colin bell and he kept her trim with a wary tread while on every side like lightning fell the heavy strokes of his boodle blade twenty onward still he held his way till he came where the column of moonshine lay and saw beneath the surface dim the brown-backed sturgeon slowly swim around him were the goblin train but he sculled with all his might and main and followed wherever the sturgeon led till he saw him upward point his head then he dropped his paddle blade and held his colin goblet up to catch the drop in its crimson cup twenty one with sweeping tail and quivering fin through the wave the sturgeon flew and like the heaven-shot javelin he sprung above the waters blue instant as the star-fall light he plunged him in the deep again but left an arc of silver bright the rainbow of the moony main it was a strange and lovely sight to see the puny goblin there he seemed an angel form of light with azure wing and sunny hair throned on a cloud of purple fair circled with blue and edged with white and sitting at the fall of evan beneath the bow of summer heaven twenty two a moment and its lustre fell but ere it met the billow blue he caught within his crimson bell a droplet of its sparkling dew joy to thee fay thy task is done thy wings are pure for the gem is won cheerly ply thy dripping oar and haste away to the elfin shore twenty three he turns and lo on either side the ripples on his path divide and the track o'er which his boat must pass is smooth as a sheet of polished glass around their limbs the sea nymphs lave with snowy arms half swelling out while on the glossed and gleamy wave their sea-green ringlets loosely float they swim around with smile and song they press the bark with pearly hand and gently urge her course along toward the beach of speckled sand and as he lightly leapt to land they bade adieu with nod and bow then gaily kissed each little hand and dropped in the crystal deep below 
24. A moment stayed the fairy there, he kissed the beach and breathed a prayer, then spread his wings of gilded blue, and on to the elfin court he flew. As ever ye saw a bubble rise, and shine with a thousand changing dyes, till lessening far through ether driven, it mingles with the hues of heaven. As at the glimpse of morning pale, the lance-fly spreads his silken sail, and gleams with blendings soft and bright, till lost in the shades of fading night. So rose from earth the lovely fay, so vanished far in heaven away. Up, fairy, quit thy chickweed bower, the cricket has called the second hour. Twice again, and the lark will rise, to kiss the streaking of the skies. Up, thy charmed armor don, thou'lt need it ere the night be gone. 25. He put his acorn helmet on, it was plumed of the silk of the thistle down. The corslet plate that guarded his breast was once the wild bee's golden vest. His cloak of a thousand mingled dyes was formed of the wings of butterflies. His shield was the shell of a ladybug queen, studs of gold on a ground of green. And the quivering lance which he brandished bright was the sting of a wasp he had slain in fight. Swift he bestrode his firefly steed, he bared his blade of the bent grass blue, he drove his spurs of the cockle seed, and away like a glance of thought he flew, to skim the heavens and follow far the fiery trail of the rocket star. 26. The moth fly, as he shot in air, crept under the leaf and hid her there. The katydid did forgot its lay, the prowling gnat fled fast away, the fell mosquito checked his drone, and folded his wings till the fay was gone, and the wily beetle dropped his head and fell on the ground as if he were dead. They crouched them close in the darksome shade, they quaked all o'er with awe and fear, for they had felt the blue bent blade and writhed at the prick of the elfin spear. Many a time on a summer's night, when the sky was clear and the moon was bright, they had been roused from the haunted ground by the yelp and bay of the fairy hound. They had heard the tiny bugle horn, they had heard of twang of the maize silk string, when the vine twig bows were tightly drawn and the nettle shaft through the air was borne, feathered with down the humbird's wing. And now they deemed the courier oaf some hunter sprite of the elfin ground, and they watched till they saw him mount the roof that canopies the world around. Then glad they left their covert lair and freaked about in the midnight air. 27. Up to the vaulted firmament, his path the firefly courser bent, and at every gallop on the wind, he flung a glittering spark behind. He flies like a feather in the blast, till the first light cloud in heaven is past. But the shapes of air have begun their work, and a drizzly mist is round him cast. He cannot see through the mantle murk, he shivers with cold, but he urges fast. Through storm and darkness, sleet and shade, he lashes his steed and spurs amain. For shadowy hands have twitched the rein, and flame-shot tongues around him played, and near him many a fiendish eye glared with a fell malignity, and yells of rage and shrieks of fear came screaming on his startled ear. 28. His wings are wet around his breast, the plume hangs dripping from his crest, his eyes are blurred with the lightning's glare, and his ears are stunned with a thunder's blare. But he gave a shout, and his blade he drew. He thrust before, and he struck behind, till he pierced their cloudy bodies through, and gashed their shadowy limbs of wind. Howling the misty specters flew, they rend the air with frightful cries. For he has gained the welkin blue, and the land of clouds beneath him lies. 29. Up to the cope careering swift, in breathless motion fast, 
fleet as the swallow cuts the drift or the sea rock rides the blast the sapphire sheet of eve is shot the sphered moon is past the earth but seems a tiny blot on a sheet of azure cast oh it was sweet in the clear moonlight to tread the starry plain of evan to meet the thousand eyes of night and feel the cooling breath of heaven but the elfin made no stop or stay till he came to the bank of the milky way then he checked his courser's foot and watched for the glimpse of the planet shoot thirty sudden along the snowy tide that swelled to meet their footsteps fall the sylphs of heaven were seen to glide attired in sunset's crimson pall around the fay they weave the dance they skip before him on the plain and one has taken his wasp sting lance and one upholds his bridal rein with warblings wild they lead him on to where through clouds of amber seen studded with stars resplendent shone the palace of the sylphid queen its spiral columns gleaming bright were streamers of the northern light its curtains light and lovely flush was of the morning's rosy blush and the ceiling fair that rose a boon the white and feathery fleece of noon thirty one but oh how fair the shape that lay beneath a rainbow bending bright she seemed to the entranced fay the loveliest of the forms of light her mantle was the purple rolled at twilight in the west afar twas tied with threads of dawning gold and buttoned with a sparkling star her face was like the lily rune that veils the vestal planet's hue her eyes two beamlets from the moon set floating in the welkin blue her hair is like the sunny beam and the diamond gems which round it gleam are the pure drops of dewy evan that ne'er have left their native heaven thirty two she raised her eyes to the wondering sprite and they leapt with smiles for well i ween never before in the bowers of light had the form of an earthly fay been seen long she looked in his tiny face long with his butterfly cloak she played she smoothed his wings of azure lace and handled the tassel of his blade and as he told in accents low the story of his love and woe she felt new pains in her bosom rise and the tear-drop started in her eyes and oh sweet spirit of earth she cried return no more to your woodland height but ever here with me abide in the land of everlasting light within the fleecy drift will lie will hang upon the rainbow's rim and all the jewels of the sky around thy brow shall brightly beam and thou shalt bathe thee in the stream that rolls its whitening foam a boon and ride upon the lightning's gleam and dance upon the orbed moon will sit within the pleiad ring will rest on orion's starry belt and i will bid my sylphs to sing the song that makes the dew mist melt their harps are of the umber shade that hides the blush of waking day and every gleamy string is made of silvery moonshine's lengthened ray and thou shalt pillow on my breast while heavenly breathings float around and with the sylphs of ether blest forget the joys of fairy ground thirty three she was lovely and fair to see and the elfin's heart beat fitfully but lovelier far and still more fair the earthly form imprinted there naught he saw in the heavens above was half so dear as his mortal love for he thought upon her looks so meek and he thought of the light flush on her cheek never again might he bask and lie on that sweet cheek and the moonlight eye but in his dreams her form to see to clasp her in his reverie to think upon his virgin bride was worth all heaven and earth beside thirty four lady he cried i have sworn to-night on the word of a fairy knight to do my sentence task aright 
my honor scarce is free from stain i may not soil its snows again betide me weal betide me woe its mandate must be answered now her bosom heaved with many a sigh the tear was in her drooping eye but she led him to the palace gate and called the sylphs who hovered there and bade them fly and bring him straight of clouds condensed a sable car with charm and spell she blessed it there from all the fiends of upper air then round him cast the shadowy shroud and tied his steed behind the cloud and pressed his hand as she bade him fly far to the verge of the northern sky for by its wane and wavering light there was a star would fall to-night thirty five born after on the wings of the blast northward away he speeds him fast and his courser follows the cloudy wain till the hoof strokes fall like pattering rain the clouds roll backward as he flies each flickering star behind him lies and he has reached the northern plain and backed his firefly steed again ready to follow in its flight the streaming of the rocket light thirty six the star is yet in the vault of heaven but its rocks in the summer gale and now tis fitful and uneven and now tis deadly pale and now tis wrapped in sulphur smoke and quenched is its rayless beam and now with a rattling thunder stroke it bursts in flash and flame as swift as the glance of the arrowy lance that the storm spirit flings from high the star shot flew or the welkin blew as it fell from the sheeted sky as swift as the wind in its trail behind the elfin gallops along the fiends of the clouds are bellowing loud but the sylphid charm is strong he gallops unhurt in the shower of fire while the cloud fiends fly from the blaze he watches each flake till its sparks expire and rides in the light of its rays but he drove his steed to the lightning speed and caught a glimmering spark then wheeled around to the fairy ground and sped through the midnight dark oaf and goblin imp and sprite elf of eve and starry fay ye that love the moon's soft light hither hither wend your way twine ye in the jocund ring sing and trip it merrily hand to hand and wing to wing round the wild witch hazel tree hail the wanderer again with dance and song and lute and lyre pure his wing and strong his chain and doubly bright his fairy fire twine ye in an airy round brush the dew and print the lee skip and gamble hop and bound round the wild witch hazel tree the beetle guards our holy ground he flies about the haunted place and if mortal there be found he hums in his ears and flaps his face the leaf harp sounds our round delay the owlet's eyes our lanterns be thus we sing and dance and play round the wild witch hazel tree but hark from tower on treetop high the sentry elf his call has made a streak is in the eastern sky shapes of moonlight flit and fade the hilltops gleam in the morning spring the skylark shakes his dappled wing the day glimpse glimmers on the lawn the cock has crowed the fays are gone end of the culprit fay Poem two of the Culprit Fay and Other Poems. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Peter Oxenhandler. The Culprit Fay and Other Poems by Joseph Rodman Drake. To a friend. You damn me with faint praise. One. Yes, faint was my applause and cold my praise. Though soul was glowing in each polished line, 
but nobler subjects claim the poet's lays. A brighter glory waits a muse like thine. Let amorous fools in lovesick measure pine. Let strange ford whimper on in fancied pain, and leave to more his rose leaves and his vine. Be thine the task of a higher crown to gain, the envied wreath that decks the patriot's holy strain. Two. Yet not in proud triumphal song alone, or martial ode, or sad sepulchral dirge. There needs no voice to make our glories known. There needs no voice the warrior's soul to urge, to tread the bounds of nature's stormy verge. Columbia still shall win the battle's prize, but be it thine to bid her mind emerge, to strike her harp until its soul arise from the neglected shade where low in dust it lies. 3. Are there no scenes to touch the poet's soul? No deeds of arms to wake the lordly strain? Shall Hudson's billows unregarded roll? Has Warren fought, Montgomery died in vain? Shame, that while every mountain stream and plain hath theme for truth's proud voice or fancy's wand, no native bard the patriot harp hath ta'en, but left to minstrels of a foreign strand to sing the beauteous scenes of nature's loveliest land. 4. Oh, for a seat on Appalachia's brow, that I might scan the glorious prospect round, wild waving woods and rolling floods below, smooth level glades and fields with grain and brown, high heaving hills with tufted forests crowned, rearing their tall tops to the heaven's blue dome, and emerald isles like banners green unwound, floating along the lake, while round them roam bright helms of billowy blue and plumes of dancing foam. 5. Tis true no fairies haunt our verdant meads, no grinning imps deform our blazing hearth. Beneath the kelpie's fang no traveller bleeds, nor gory vampire taints our holy earth nor spectres stalk to frighten harmless mirth, nor tortured demon howls adown the gale. Fair reason checks these monsters in their birth. Yet have we lay of love and horrid tale, would dim the manliest eye and make the bravest pale. 6. Where is the stony eye that hath not shed compassion's heart drops o'er the sweet McRae? Through midnight's wilds by savage bandits led. Her heart is sad, her love is far away. Elate that lover waits the promised day. When he shall clasp his blooming bride again. Shine on, sweet visions. Dream of rapture, play. Soon the cold course of her he loved in vain. Shall blight his withered heart and fire his frenzied brain. 7. Romantic Wyoming. Could none be found, of all that rove thy Eden groves among, To wake a native harp's untutored sound, And give thy tale of woe the voice of song? Oh, if description's cold and nerveless tongue From stranger harps such hallowed strains could call, How doubly sweet the descant wild had rung, From one who, lingering round thy ruined wall, Had plucked thy morning flowers, and wept thy timeless fall. 8. The Huron chief escaped from foemen nigh. His frail bark launches on Niagara's tides. Pride in his port, defiance in his eye. Singing his song of death, the warrior glides. In vain they yell along the river sides. In vain the arrow from its sheaf is torn. Come to his doom, the willing victim rides. Until adown the roaring torrent born mocks them with gesture proud and laughs their rage to scorn. 9. But if the charms of daisied hill and vale, and rolling flood and towering rock sublime, if warrior deed or peasant's lowly tale of love or woe should fail to wake the rhyme, 
If to the wildest heights of song you climb, Though some who know you less might cry, Beware, onward, I say, Your strains shall conquer time. Give your bright genius wing, And hope to share imagination's worlds, The ocean, earth, and air. 10. Arouse, my friend, let vivid fancy soar, Look with creative eye on nature's face, Bid airy spirits in wild Niagara roar, And view in every field a fairy race, Spur thy good pacolet to speed apace, And spread a train of nymphs on every shore, Or if thy muse would woo a ruder grace, The Indian's evil manitous explore, And rear the wondrous tale of legendary lore. 11. Away to Susquehanna's utmost springs, Where throned in mountain mist, Ariuski reigns, Shrouding in lurid clouds his plumeless wings, And sternly sorrowing o'er his tribe's remains. His was the arm, like comet ere it wanes, That tore the streamy lightnings from the skies, And smote the mammoth of the southern plains, Wild with dismay the creek affrighted flies, while in triumphant pride Kanawa's eagles rise. 12. Or westward far, where dark Miami wends, seek that fair spot as yet to fame unknown, where, when the vesper dew of heaven descends, soft music breathes in many a melting tone, at times so sadly sweet it seems the moan of some poor Ariel penanced in the rock. Anon a louder burst, a scream, a groan, And now amid the tempest's reeling shock, Gibber and shriek and wail, And fiend-like laugh and mock. 13. Or climb the palisado's lofty brows, Where dark Omana waged the war of hell, Till waked to wrath, the mighty spirit rose, and pent the demons in their prison cell. Full on their head the uprooted mountain fell, and closing all within its horrid womb, straight from the teeming earth the waters swell, and pillared rocks arise in cheerless gloom around the drear abode, their last eternal tomb. 14. Be these your future themes, no more resign the soul of song to laud your lady's eyes. Go, kneel a whisperer at nature's shrine, for you her fields are green and fair her skies, for you her rivers flow, her hills arise, and will you scorn them all to pour forth tame and heartless lays of feigned or fancied sighs? Still will you cloud the muse? nor blush for shame to cast away renown and hide your head from fame. End of poem. Section 3 of The Culprit Fay and Other Poems This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Peter Oxenhandler. The Culprit Fay and Other Poems by Joseph Rodman Drake. Leon. Extracts from Leon, an unfinished poem. It is a summer evening, calm and fair, a warm yet freshening glow is in the air. Along its bank the cool stream wanders slow, like parting friends that linger as they go. The willows, as its waters meekly glide, Bend their disheveled tresses to the tide, And seem to give it, with a moaning sigh, A farewell touch of tearful sympathy. Each dusky corpse is clad in darkest green, A blackening mass just edged with silver sheen, From yon clear moon, who in her glassy face Seems to reflect the risings of the place, for on her still, pale orb the eye may see Dim spots of shadowy brown, like distant tree, Or far-off hillocks on a moonlight lee. 
the stars have lit in heavens their lamps of gold. The viewless dew falls lightly on the wold. The gentle air that softly sweeps the leaves, a strain of faint unearthly music weaves, as when the harp of heaven remotely plays. Or signet wail, or song of sorrowing fays, that float amid the moonshine glimmerings pale, on wings of woven air in some enchanted vale. It is an eve that drops a heavenly balm, to lull the feelings to a sober calm, to bid wild passions fiery flush depart, and smooth the troubled waters of the heart, to give a tranquil fixedness to grief, a cherished gloom that wishes no relief. Torn is that heart, and bitter are its throes, that cannot feel on such a night repose, and yet one breast there is that breathes this air, an eye that wanders o'er the prospect fair, that sees you placid moon and the pure sky of mild unclouded blue, and still that eye is thrown in restless vacancy around, or cast in gloomy trance on the cold ground. And still that breast with maddening passion burns, and hatred, love, and sorrow rule by turns. A lovely figure, and in happier hour, when pleasure laughed abroad from hall and bower, the general eye had deemed her smiling face the brightest jewel in the courtly place. So glossy is her hair's ensabled wreath, so glowing warm the eye that burns beneath, with so much graceful sweetness of address, and such a form of rounded slenderness. Ah, where is he on whom these beauties shine, but deems a spotless soul inhabits such a shrine? And yet a keen observer might espy strange passions lurking in her deep black eye, and in the lines of her fine lip, a soul that in its every feeling spurned control. They passed unnoted, who will stop to trace a sullying spot on beauty's sparkling face? And no one deemed amid her glances sweet, hers was a bosom of impetuous heat, a heart too wildly in its joyous elate, formed but to madly love or madly hate, a spirit of strong throbs and steadfast will, to dote, detest, to die for, or to kill, which, like the Arab chief, would fiercely dare to stab the heart she might no longer share, and yet so tender, if he loved again, would die to save his breast one moment's pain. But he who cast his gaze upon her now, and read the traces written on her brow, had scarce believed hers was that form of light that beamed like fabled wonder on the sight. Her raven hair hung down in loosened tress before her wan cheek's pallid ghastliness, and through its thick locks showed the deadly white like marble glimpses of a tomb at night. In fixed and horrid musings now she stands, her eyes now bent to earth and her cold hands, pressed to her heart now wildly thrown on high, they wander o'er her brow, and now a sigh breaks deep and full, and more composedly she half exclaims, No, no, it cannot be. He loves not, never loved. Not even when he pressed my wedded hand I knew it then. And yet, fool that I was, I saw he strove in vain to kindle pity into love. But Florence, she so loved, a sister too, my earliest, dearest playmate, one who grew upon my very heart to rend it so. His falsehood I could bear, but hers, ah, no, she is not false. I feel she loves me yet, and if my boding bosom could forget its wild imaginings with what sweet pain I'd clasp my Florence to my breast again, with that came many a thought of days gone by, remembered joys of mirthful infancy, and youth's gay frolic, and the short-lived flow of showering tears in childhood's fleeting woe, and life's maturer friendship, and the sense of heart-warm, open, fearless confidence. All these came thronging with a tender call, and her own Florence mingled with them all, and softened feelings rose amid her pain. 
while from her eyes the clouds melted in gentle rain. A hectic pleasure flushed her faded face. It fled, and deeper paleness took its place. Then a cold shudder thrilled her, and at last her lip a smile of bitter sarcasm cast, as if she scorned herself, that she could be a moment lulled by that sweet sophistry. For in that little minute's memory's sting gave word and look, sigh, gesture, everything, to bid these dear delusive phantoms fly and fix her fears in dreadful certainty. It traced the very progress of their love from the first meeting in the locust grove, when from the chase Leon came bounding there, backing his courser with a noble air, his brown cheek flushed with healthful exercise, and his warm spirits leaping in his eyes, it told how lovely looked her sister then, to long-lost friends and home just come again. How on her cheek the tears of meeting lay, that tear which only feeling hearts can pay, while the quick pleasure glistened in her eye, like clouds and sunshine in an April sky, and then it told, as their acquaintance grew, how close the unseen bonds of union drew, their souls together, and how pleased they were, the same blithe pastimes and delights to share, how the same chord in each at once would strike, their taste, their wishes, and their joys alike. All this was innocent, but soon there came blushes and starts of consciousness and shame, that when she entered upon either cheek, the hasty blood in guilty red would speak of something that should not be known, and still sighs half suppressed seemed struggling with the will it told how oft at eve was leon gone in moody wandering to the wood alone and in the night how many a broken dream of bliss or terror seemed to shake his frame how florence too in long abstracted fit of soul-wrapped musings for whole hours would sit not even the power of music friend or book could chase her deep forgetfulness of look. And how, when questioned, with an indrawn sigh, in vague and far-off phrase, she made reply, and smiled and struggled to be gay and free, and then relapsed in dreaming reverie, how when of Leon she was forced to speak, unbidden crimson mantled in her cheek, and when he entered how her eye would swim, and strive to look on every one but him, Yet, by unconscious fascination led, In quick short glance each moment toward him fled, How he too seemed to shun her speech and gaze, And yet he always lingered where she was, Though nothing in his aspect or his air Told that he knew she was in presence there. But an appearance of constrained distress, And a dull tongue of moveless silentness, and a down-drooping eye of gloom and sadness. Oh, how unlike his former face of gladness! "'Tis plain, tis plain, and I am lost,' she cried, and in that thought her last good feeling died. That thought of hopeless sorrow seemed to dart a thousand stings at once into her heart, but a strong effort quelled it, and she gave the next to hatred, vengeance and the grave her face was calmly stern and but a glare within her eyes there was no feature there that told what lasting friends her inmates were within there was no thought to bid her swerve from her intent but every strained nerve was settled and bent up with terrible force to some deep deed far far beyond remorse no glimpse of mercy's light her purpose crossed. Love, nature, pity in its depths were lost, or lent an added fury to the ire that seared her soul with unconsuming fire. All that was dear in the wide earth was gone. She loved but two, and these she doted on, with passionate ardor and the close strong press of women's heart cord clinging tenderness. These links were torn, and now she stood alone, bereft of all her husband, sister, gone. Ah, who can tell that ne'er has known such fate? What wild and dreadful strength it gives to hate! What had she left? 
Revenge, revenge was there. He crushed remorse and wrestled down despair, held his red torch in memory's page and threw a bloody stain on every line she drew. She felt dark pleasure with her frenzy blend and hugged him to her heart and called him friend. When sorrowing clouds the face of heaven deform and hope's bright star sets darkly in the storm, around us ghastly shapes and phantoms swim and all beyond is formless, vague, and dim, or life's cold, barren path before us slies, a wild and weary waste of tears and sighs, from the lorn heart each sweetening solace, gone, abandoned, friendless, withered, lost, and lone, and when with keener pangs we bleed to know that hands beloved have struck the deepest blow that friends we deemed most true and held most dear have stretched the pall of death o'er pleasure's bier repaid our trusting faith with serpent guile cursed with a kiss and stabbed beneath a smile what then remains for souls of tender mould one last and silent refuge calm and cold a resting place for misery a gentle slave hearts break but once no wrongs can reach the grave Rest ye, mild spirits of afflicted worth, sweet is your slumber in the quiet earth, and soon the voice of heaven shall bid you rise to meet rewarding smiles in yonder skies. But where for solace shall the bosom turn, for death too strong, for tears too proudly stern? When shall the lulling dews of peace descend on hearts that cannot break and will not bend? Ah, never! Never they are doomed to feel pains that no balm of heaven on earth can heal. To live in groans and yield their parting breath, without a joy in life or hope in death. Yet for a while one living hope remains, that nerves each fibre and the soul sustains. One desperate hope, such agonizing throes are bitterer far than all the worst of woes. A hope of crime and horrors, wild and strange as demon thoughts that hope is thine revenge twas this that gave o oh, eleanor to thee a strength to bear the matchless misery though the hot blood ran boiling in her brain and rolled a tide of fire through every vein though many a rushing voice of blighted bliss struck on her mental ears like adder's hiss that hope gave gloomy fierceness to her eye dashed down the tear, repressed the unloading sigh, fixed her wan, quivering lip, and steeled her breast to crush the hearts, and robbed her own of rest. She wound her way within a heavy shade, of arching boughs in broad-spread leaves arrayed, which, clustering close and thick, shut out the light, and tinged with black the shadowy robe of night, save here and there a melancholy spark, of flickering moonshine glimmered through the dark cheerless and dim as when upon a pall through suffering tears the looks of sorrow fall but opening farther on on either side a wider space the severing trees divide and longer gleams upon the pathway meet and the soft grass is wet beneath her feet and now emerging from the darksome shade she pressed the silken carpet of the glade beyond the green Within its western close, a little vine-hung leafy arbor rose, where the pale luster of the moony flood dimmed the vermilion woodbine's scarlet bud, and glancing through the foliage fluttering round, in tiny circles gleamed the freckled ground. Beside the porch, beneath the friendly screen of two tall trees, a mossy bank was seen, and all around, amid the silvery dew, the wild wood pansy reared her petals blue, and gold cups and the meadow's cowslip red upon the evening air their odors shed. Unheeded all the grove's deep gloom had been, unseen the moonlight brightness of the green, in vain the stream's blue burnish met her eye, lovely its wave but passed unnoticed by. The airs of heaven had breathed around her brow their cooling sighs. She felt them not, but now that lonely bower appeared, and with a start 
convulsive shudders thrilled her throbbing heart and there in days alas for ever gone when love's young torch with beams of rapture shone when she had felt her heart's impassioned swell and almost deemed her leon loved as well there had she sat beneath the evening skies felt his warm kiss and heard his murmured sighs hung on his breast caressing and caressed her husband smiled and eleanor was blessed and when his injured country's rights to shield blazed his red banner on the battlefield there had she lingered in the shadows dim and sat till morning watch and thought of him and wept to think that she might not be there his toils his dangers and the wounds to share and when the foe had bowed beneath his brand and to his home he led his conquering band there she first caught the long-expected face and sprung to smile and weep in his embrace these scenes of bliss across her memory fled like lights that haunt the chambers of the dead she saw the bower and read the image there of joys that had been and of woes that were she clenched her hand in agony and cast a glance of tears upon it as she passed a look of weeping sorrow twas the last she checked the gush of feeling turned her face and faster sped along her hurried pace no longer now from leon's lips were heard the sigh of bliss the rapture breathing word no longer now upon his features dwelt the glance that sweetly thrills the looks that melt no speaking gaze of fond attachment told but all was dull and gloomy sad and cold yet he was kind or labored to be kind and strove to hide the workings of his mind and cloaked his heart to soothe his wife's distress under a mask of tender gentleness it was in vain for ah how light and frail to love's keen eye is falsehood's gilded veil sweet winning words may not a time beguile professions lull and oaths deceive a while but soon the heart is vague suspicion toast most feel a void unfilled a something lost something scarce heated and unprized till gone felt while unseen and though unnoticed known a hidden witchery a nameless charm too fine for actions and for words to warn that passing all the worthless forms of art eludes the sense and only woos the heart a hallowed spell by fond affection wove the mute but matchless eloquence of love ah there were times when to my heart there came all that the soul can feel or fancy frame the summer party in the open air when sunny eyes and cordial hearts were there where light came sparkling through the greenwood eaves like mirthful eyes that laugh upon the leaves where every bush and tree in all the scene in wind-kissed wavings shake their wings of green and all the objects round about dispense reviving freshness to the awakened sense the golden corslet of the humble bee the antic kid that frolics round the lee or purple lance-flies circling round the place on their light shards of green an airy race or squirrel glancing from the nutwood shade an arch-black eye half pleased and half afraid or bird quick darting through the foliage dim or perched and twittering on the tendril slim or poised in either sailing slowly on with plumes that change and glisten in the sun like rainbows fading into mist and then on the bright cloud renewed and changed again or soaring upward with his full sweet throat pours clear and strong a pleasure-speaking note and sings in nature's language wild and free his song of praise for light and liberty and when within with poetry and song music and books led the glad hours along worlds of the visioned minstrel fancy wove tales of old time of chivalry and love of converse calm or witch shafts sprinkled round like beams from gems too light and fine to wound with spirits sparkling as the morning sun light as the dancing wave he smiles upon like his own course alas too soon to know bright suns may set in storms and gay hearts sink in woe end of section three
Niagara, The Culprit's Fay, and Other Poems. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Niagara, The Culprit's Fay, and Other Poems by Joseph Rodman Drake. 1. Roar, raging torrent, and thou mighty river, pour thy white foam on the valley below, Frown, ye dark mountains, and shadow forever the deep rocky bed where the wild rapids flow. The green sunny glade and the smooth flowing fountain brighten the home of the coward and slave. The flood and the forest, the rock and the mountain, rare on their bosoms, the free and the brave. 2. Nurslings of nature, I mark your bold bearing, pride in each aspect and strength in each form. Hearts of warm impulse and souls of high daring, Born in the battle and reared in the storm, The red levin flash and the thunder's dread rattle, The rock-riven wave and the war-trumpet's breath, The din of the tempest, the yell of the battle, Nerve your steeled bosoms to danger and death. 3. High on the brow of the Alps' snowy towers, The mountain Swiss measures his rock-breasted moors, o'er his lone cottage the avalanche lowers round his rude portal the spring torrent pours sweet is his sleep amid peril and danger warm is his greeting to kindred and friends open his hands to the poor and the stranger stern on his foeman his saber descends four lo where the tempest the dark waters sunder slumbers the sailor boy reckless and brave Warmed by the lighting and lulled by the thunder, Fawned by the whirlwind and rocked on the wave, Wildly the winter wind howls round his pillow, Cold on his bosom the spray showers fall, Creaks the strained mast at the rush of the billow, Peaceful he slumbers regardless of all. 5. Mark how the cheek of the warrior flushes, As the battle drum beats and the war torches glare, like a blast of the north to the onset he rushes, and his wide-waving falchion gleams brightly in air. Around him the death-shot of foemen are flying. At his feet friends and comrades are yielding their breath. He strikes to the groans of the wounded and dying, but the war-cry he strikes with is conquest or death. 6. Then pour thy broad wave like a flood from the heavens, each sun that thou rarest in the battle's wild shock, when the death-speaking note of the trumpet is given, will charge like thy torrent or stand like thy rock. Let his roof be the cloud and the rock be his pillow. Let him stride the rough mountain or toss on the foam. He will strike fast and well on the field or the billow in triumph and glory for God and his home. End of Niagara Song, O Go to Sleep, My Baby Dear, of the Culprit Fay and Other Poems. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Peter Oxenhandler. The Culprit Fay and Other Poems by Joseph Rodman Drake. Song, O oh, Go to Sleep, My Baby Dear, and I will hold thee on my knee, thy mother's in her winding sheet, and thou art all that's left to me. My hairs are white with grief and age, I've borne the weight of every ill, and I would lay me with my child, but thou art left to love me still. Should thy false father see thy face, the tears would fill his cruel eye, but he has scorned thy mother's woe. And he shall never look on thee, but I will rear thee up alone, and with me thou shalt I remain, for thou wilt have thy mother's smile, and I shall see my child again. End of poem, song, O go to sleep, my baby dear. Song, O oh, the tear is in my eye. From the Culprit Fay and Other Poems by Joseph Rodman Drake. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Song Oh, the Tear is in My Eye by Joseph Rodman Drake Oh, the tear is in my eye, and my heart it is breaking. Thou hast fled from me, Connor, and left me forsaken. Bright and warm was our morning, but soon has it faded. For I gave thee a true heart, and thou hast betrayed it. Thy footsteps I followed in darkness and danger, From the home of my love to the land of the stranger. Thou wert mine through the tempest, the blight, and the burning. Could I think thou wouldst change when the morn was returning? Yet peace to thy heart, though from mine it must sever. May she love thee as I loved, alone and forever. I may weep for thy loss, but my faith is unshaken, and the heart thou hast widowed will bless thee in breaking. End of poem. Chapter 7 of The Culprit Fay and Other Poems by Joseph Rodman Drake. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Larry Wilson. Written in a Lady's Album. Grant me, I cried, some spell of art to turn with all a lover's care that spotless page, my Eva's heart, and write my burning wishes there. But love, by faithless Leah taught, how frail is woman's holiest vow, looked down while grace a tempered thought, sate serious on his baby brow. Go, blot her album, cried the sage. There none but bards a place may claim, but woman's heart's a worthless page, where every fool may write his name. Until by time or fate decayed, that line and leaf shall never part. Ah, who can tell how soon shall fade the lines of love from woman's heart? End of chapter 7Chapter 8 of The Culprit Fay and Other Poems by Joseph Rodman Drake. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Lines to a Lady on Hearing Her Sing Kushla Matri. Yes, heaven protect thee, thou gem of the ocean, dear land of my sires, though distant thy shores, ere my heart cease to love thee. Its latest emotion, the last dying throbs of its pulse must be o'er. And dark were the bosom, and cold and unfeeling, that tamely could listen unmoved at the call. When woman, the warm soul of melody stealing, laments for her country, and sighs o'er its fall. Sing on, gentle warbler, the teardrop appearing shall fall for the woes of the queen of the sea. And the spirit that breathes in the harp of green Erin, descending, shall hail thee her Kushla Matri. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Chapter 9 of The Culprit Fay and Other Poems by Joseph Rodman Drake. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Larry Wilson. Lines Written on Leaving New Rochelle Whene'er thy wandering footsteps bends its pathway to the hermit's tree, among its cordial band of friends, sweet Mary, wilt thou number me? Though all too few the hours have rolled that saw the stranger linger here, in memory's volume let them hold one little spot to friendship dear. I oft have thought how sweet twould be to steal the bird of Eden's art, and leave behind a trace of me on every kind and friendly heart. And like the breeze in fragrance rolled, to gather as I wander by, from every soul of kindred mould some touch of cordial sympathy. Tis the best charm in life's dull dream, to feel that yet there linger here bright eyes that look with fond esteem and feeling hearts that hold me dear. End of chapter 9 
Chapter Ten of the Culprit Fay and Other Poems by Joseph Rodman Drake. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Christine G. Hope. See through yon clouds that rolls in wrath, one little star benignant peep, to light along their trackless path, that wanders of the stormy deep, and thus, O oh hope, thy lovely form, in sorrow's gloomy night shall be. The sun that looks through cloud and storm Upon a dark and moonless sea. When heaven is all serene and fair, Full many a brighter gem we meet. Tis when the tempest hovers there, Thy beam is most divinely sweet. The rainbow, when the sun declines, Like faithless friend will disappear. Thy light, dear star, more brightly shines When all is wail and weeping hair. And though Aurora's stealing beam May wake a morning of delight, Tis only thy consoling beam Will smile amid affliction's night. End of chapter 10「Chapter 11 of The Culprit Fay and Other Poems by Joseph Rodman Drake This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Christine G. Fragment. One. To Skara thou art lovely now, Thy woods that frowned in sullen strength, Like plumage on a giant's brow, Have bowed their massy pride at length. The rustling mace is green around, The sheep is in the conger's bed, And clear the ploughman's whistling sound, Where war-whoops pealed over mangle dead. Fair cots around thy breast are set, Like pearls upon a coronet, And in Aluga's vale below, the gilded grain is moving slow, Like yellow moonlight on the sea, Where waves are swelling peacefully, As beauty's breast when quiet dreams Come tranquilly and gentle by, When all she loves and hopes for seems To float in smiles before her eye. 2. And hast thou lost the grandeur rude That made me breathless when at first Upon my infant sight you burst, The monarch of the solitude, no, there is yet thy turret rock, the watch-tower of the skies the lair, of Indian gods who, in the shock, of bursting thunder slumbered there. And trim thy bosom is arrayed, in labour's green and glittering vest, and yet thy forest locks of shade, shake stormy in that turret crest. Still hast thou left the rocks, the floods, and nature is the loveliest then, when first amid her caves and woods she feels the busy tread of men when every tree and bush and flower springs wildly in its native grace, ere art exerts her boasted power that brightened only to deface. 3. Yes, thou art lovelier now than ever, how sweet would be when all the air in moonlight swims along thy river, to couch upon the grass and hear Niagara's everlasting voice far in the deep blue west away, that dreaming and poetic noise we mark not in the glare of day. Oh, how unlike its torrent cry, when over the brink the tide is driven, as if the vast and sheeted sky in thunder fell from heaven. 4. Were I but there, the daylight fled, with that smooth air the stream, the sky, and lying in that minstrel bed, of nature's own embroidery, with those long tearful willows over me, that weeping fount that solemn light, with scenes of sighing tales before me, and one green maiden grave in sight, how mournful the strain would rise of that true maid whose fate can yet draw rainy tears from stubborn eyes, from lids that never before were wet. She lies not here, but that green grave is sacred from the plough and flowers, snowdrops and valley lilies wave, amid the grass and other showers, than those of heaven have fallen there. End of chapter 11 Chapter 12 of The Culprit Fay and Other Poems by Joseph Rodman Drake This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Larry Wilson to blank. When that eye of light shall in darkness fall, and thy bosom be shrouded in death's cold pall, 
when the bloom of that rich red lip shall fade and thy head on its pillow of dust be laid oh then thy spirit shall see how true are the holy vows i have breathed to you my form shall moulder thy grave beside and in the blue heavens i'll seek my bride then we'll tell as we tread yon azure sphere of the woes we have known while lingering here and our spirits shall joy that their pilgrimage o'er they have met in the heavens to sever no more End of Two Blank Chapter 13 of The Culprit Fay and Other Poems by Joseph Rodman Drake. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Larry Wilson. Lines Day gradual fades in evening gray. Its last faint beam hath fled and sinks the sun's declining ray in ocean's wavy bed so o'er the loves and joys of youth thy waves indifference roll so mantles round our days of truth that death pool of the soul spreads o'er the heavens the shadowy night her dim and shapeless form so human pleasures frail and light are lost in passion's storm so fades the sunshine of the breast so passion's dreamings fall so friendship's fervors sink to rest oblivion shrouds them all end of lines chapter fourteen of the culprit fay and other poems by joseph rodman drake this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Christine G. To Eva A beam upon the myrtle fell From dewy evening's purer sky. T'was like the glance I loved so well, Dear Eva, from thy moonlight eye. I looked around the summer grove, On every tree its lustre shone, For all had felt that look of love The silly myrtle deemed its own. Eva, behold thine image there, as fair as false thy glances fall. But who the worthless smile would share, that sheds it light alike on all? End of chapter 14 Chapter 15 of The Culprit Fay and Other Poems by Joseph Rodman Drake This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Newgate Novelist To a Lady with a Withered Violet Though fate upon this faded flower his withering hand has laid, Its odoured breath defies his power, its sweets are undecayed. And thus, although thy warbled strains no longer wildly thrill, The memory of the song remains, its soul is with me still. End of chapter 15 Chapter 16 of The Culprit Fay and Other Poems by Joseph Rodman Drake. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Larry Wilson. Bronx. I sat me down upon a green bank side, skirting the smooth edge of a gentle river, whose waters seemed unwilling to glide like parting friends who linger while they sever in force to go yet seeming still unready backward they wind their way in many a wistful eddy gray o'er my head the yellow vested willow ruffled its hoary top in the fresh breezes glancing in light like sprays on a green billow or the fine frostwork which young winter freezes when first his power in infant pastime trying congeals sad autumn's tears on the dead branches lying from rocks around hung the loose ivy dangling and in the clefts sumac of liveliest green bright icing stars the little beech was spangling 
the gold cup sorrel from his gauzy screen shone like a fairy crown enchased and beaded left on some morn when light flashed in their eyes unheeded the humbird shook his sun-touched wings around the blue finch carolled in the still retreat the antic squirrel capered on the ground where lichens made a carpet for his feet through the transparent waves the ruddy minkle shot up in glimmering sparks his red fin's tiny twinkle there were dark cedars with loose mossy tresses white powdered dog trees and stiff hollies flaunting gaudy as rustics in their may-day dresses blue pelerote from purple leaves upslanting a modest gaze like eyes of a young maiden shining beneath dropped lids the evening of her wedding the breeze fresh springing from the lips of morn kissing the leaves and sighing so to lose em the winding of their merry locust horn the glad spring gushing from the rock's bare bosom sweet sights sweet sounds all sights all sounds excelling oh twas a ravishing spot formed for a poet's dwelling and did i leave thy loveliness to stand again in the dull world of earthly blindness pained with the pressure of unfriendly hands sick of smooth looks agued with icy kindness left i for this thy shades were none intrude to prison wandering thought and mar sweet solitude yet i will look upon thy face again my own romantic bronx and it will be a face more pleasant than the face of men thy waves are old companions I shall see a well-remembered form in each old tree, and hear a voice long loved in thy wild minstrelsy. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Chapter 17 of The Culprit Fay and Other Poems by Joseph Rodman Drake. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain song tis not the beam of her bright blue eye nor the smile of her lip of rosy dye nor the dark brown wreaths of her glossy hair nor her changing cheek so rich and rare oh these are the sweets of a fairy dream the changing hues of an april sky they fade like dew in the morning beam or the passing zephyr's odoured sigh Tis a dearest spell that bids me kneel, Tis the heart to love, and the soul to feel, Tis the mind of light, and the spirit free, And the bosom that heaves alone for me. Oh, these are the sweets that kindly stay, From youth's gay morning to age's night, When beauty's rainbow tints decay, Love's torch still burns with a holy light. Soon will the bloom of the fairest fade, And love will droop in the cheerless shade, Or if tears should fall on his wing of joy, It will hasten the flight of the laughing boy. But, oh, the light of the constant soul Nor time can darken, nor sorrow dim, Though woe may weep in life's mingled bowl, Love still shall hover around its brim. End of Song To Sarah of The Culprit Fay and Other Poems by Joseph Rodman Drake. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. One, one happy year has fled, Sal, since you were all my own. The leaves have felt the autumn blight, the wintry storm has blown. We heeded not the cold blast nor the winter's icy air, for we found our climate in the heart, and it was summer there. 2. The summer's sun is bright, Sal, the skies are pure in hue, but clouds will sometimes sadden them, and dim their lovely blue, and clouds may come to us, Sal, but sure they will not stay, for there's a spell in fond hearts to chase their gloom away. 3. In sickness and in sorrow thine eyes were on me still, and there was comfort in each glance to charm the sense of ill. 
and were they absent now, Sal, I'd seek my bed of pain, and bless each pang that gave me back those looks of love again. 4. O oh, pleasant is the welcome kiss when day's dull round is o'er, and sweet the music of the step that meets me at the door. Those worldly cares may visit us, I reck not when they fall, while I have thy kind lips, my cell, to smile away them all. End of To Sarah Chapter 19 of The Culprit Fay and Other Poems by Joseph Rodman Drake this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by David Lawrence. Wasega Beach, May 2015. Chapter 19. The American Flag. When Freedom from her mountain height unfurled her standard to the air, she tore the azure robe of night and set the stars of glory there. She mingled with its gorgeous dyes the milky baldric of the skies, and stripped its pure celestial white with streakings of the morning light. Then from his mansion in the sun she called her eagle-bearer down and gave into his mighty hand the symbol of her chosen land. Majestic monarch of the cloud who rearest aloft thy regal form to hear the tempest trumpings loud and see the lightning lances driven when strive the warriors of the storm and rolls the thunder drum of heaven child of the sun to thee tis given to guard the banner of the free to hover in the sulphur smoke to ward away the battle stroke and bid its blendings shine afar like rainbows on the cloud of war the harbingers of victory flag of the brave thy fold shall fly the sign of hope and triumph high when speaks the signal trumpet tone and the long line comes gleaming on yet ere the lifeblood warm and wet has dimmed the glistening bayonet each soldier eye shall brightly turn to where thy sky-born glories burn and as his springing steps advance catch war and vengeance from the glance and when the cannon mouthings loud heave in wild wreaths the battle shroud and gory sabres rise and fall like shoots of flame on midnight's pall. Then shall thy meteor glances glow, and cowering foes shall shrink beneath each gallant arm that strikes below that lovely messenger of death. Flag of the seas, on ocean wave, thy stars shall glitter o'er the brave, when death, careening on the gale, sweeps darkly round, the bellied sail and frighted waves rush wildly back before the broadsides reeling rack each dying wanderer of the sea shall look at once to heaven and thee and smile to see thy splendors fly in triumph o'er his closing eye flag of the free hearts hope and home by angel hands to valor given the stars have lit the welkin dome and all thy hues were born in heaven. For ever float that standard sheet, where breathes the foe but falls before us, with freedom's soil beneath our feet, and freedom's banner streaming o'er us. End of chapter 19 End of The Culprit Fay and Other Poems by Joseph Rodman Drake